this voyage was the most important journey ever made. It changed our ideas of time, space, chance, sex, and nature. And what a privilege to be making it myself. <laughs> Can't believe it. <laughs> All this beauty, all this profusion, the world's full of um, wondrous forms. Hundreds of thousands of birds <laughs> and the dolphins all coming racing to the ship. And there's this plankton coming in the, from the plankton recorder. Nothing brought it alive like being on this ship. This is just beyond belief. To go to a forbidden area in there, were these enormous tracks of the megatherium. That was ridiculous. And then just round the corner, we waited for this thing called Mel, and he's uh, an orca. <laughs> Galapagos, and it was a paradise. It's just the strangest, most wonderful feeling to walk amongst these animals and birds and not feel an intruder. They don't, they like you, they don't mind. It was all, it's all just too special for, yeah, that's what I'll remember. In September 2009, I left Plymouth in England to embark on a great adventure. I was invited to set sail with the clipper Stadt Amsterdam and make the same journey that the young naturalist Charles Darwin undertook 179 years ago. The Beagle's circumnavigation of the Earth is the most important journey ever made, far more important than man's voyage to the moon. And I will be repeating this journey together with Darwin's great-great-granddaughter, Sarah. It's a chance of several lifetimes. We have begun a voyage that will take at least eight months. What a pleasure. It took Darwin some five years in his time. In the course of that expedition, Darwin made discoveries that would change the way we see the world and ourselves. And now, now we will look at the state the world is in and what possible consequences this could have for our future. With this in mind, Different scientists and artists have been invited aboard at different stages of the journey. The first few days of the voyage are calm. Being on the ship is a delight. I have read deeply in Darwin, particularly, of course, the book that made him famous, The Origin of Species, that put the story of the creation of the world under serious review. On the first days of our trip, we can't talk enough about it, and I learn so much. This is when we have palm trees on the North Pole. Palm trees on the North Pole? Palm trees, crocodiles, tropical plankton, all roaming around on the North Pole. The scientists have come along in order to conduct all sorts of research on board. But for the moment, we are still just basking in the pure pleasure of being here. Now, if you look down there, Leo, you might see your first dolphin. The rhythmic movement of a ship, the roll, pitch, surge and yaw. You can stare into the seas for hours, contemplating how Darwin's trip might have been.
I literally find a ship, when I'm not sick, nearly as comfortable as a house. It is an excellent place for working and reading. And already I look forward to going to sea as a place of rest, in short, my home. I'm thoroughly convinced that such a good opportunity of seeing the world might not come again for a century. The ship set sail for Tenerife. In Darwin's day, photography had not yet been invented. People drew what they saw. And so, a ship's artist was taken aboard, as we have done now. Anthony Smith is an artist, as well as a sculptor, and a great admirer of Darwin. So at the moment, as I say, it's just oh, fairly, fairly generic um, it features. Nice with but... the tea towel on his head. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? That's the main reference source. But well, it's not particularly helpful for a sculptor because it's no. it's almost straight on. And so you can't really see things like the no, projection of the nose it. and the yes. brow, yeah. which were... Which we know was quite prominent most in the older, important features, older really, man. Yes. Yeah. Well, you'd probably be able to tell which Darwin looks most like Charles yeah. then, wouldn't you? Some of them, yeah. yeah. So I reckon my uncle's got his nose, actually. More likely. <laughs> Darwin returns to Cambridge as a bronze statue. This is where his life as a scientist began. Anthony has sculpted him sitting on a bench with a view of his old student rooms. But his body of thought will travel with us in the shape of a book, in the minds of the travelers, and even perhaps, as he thought in later life, in the pangenes of his descendants. We have now arrived at the island of Tenerife. Anthony has been looking for original drawings made by the Beagle artists. And he has found some real masterpieces. The drawing that was made of Tenerife on Darwin's journey tells an extraordinary story. So this is a print of the really quite faded uh, watercolor that Augustus Earl did. There's probably a point a little further south on uh, Tenerife than this. But you can see the sort of the characteristic high band of cliff, just rugged outline. This is as close as Darwin ever got to realizing his dream of going to Tenerife, which is it's the place that he longs to visit more than anywhere else. He'd read so much about it, and they weren't allowed to land on Tenerife um, because of the quarantine of uh, cholera that had uh, they'd heard of an outbreak in England, and they'd, all ships coming from England were having to be quarantined. This is as close as he got, which is a real tragedy. Both Charles Darwin and I would have loved to climb the tide of volcano in the footsteps of Darwin's hero, the great naturalist Alexander von Humboldt. He described the ascent to the peak as early as 1799. But just as Darwin was not allowed to set foot on land, I was told by my doctor not to climb volcanoes. It's very, very yeah. sad. Now, well, look, you're the Darwin here, aren't you? And I'm the Humboldt. I'm the Darwin. But look, Darwin, <laughs> this is the very edition that he would have read of Humboldt, who was, at this stage was his hero. Now Humboldt, most of this book, 90% of it is geology. And Darwin thought of himself as a geologist at the time. And look at these, um, this is Humboldt writing. Uh, he's so pleased that he got to Tenerife. Look, it would have been very painful to naturalists to have seen the coast of Tenerife without having been able to tread a soil torn up by volcanoes. And now we now see that what was poor Darwin says. Darwin, yes. He says, would have read on that. the 6th in the evening we sailed into harbour of Santa Cruz, which is where we are here, and I now felt even moderately well, I was picturing myself all the delights of fresh fruit growing in the beautiful valleys and reading Humboldt's descriptions of the island's glorious views, when perhaps you may nearly guess at our disappointment when a small, pale man informed us <laughs> we must perform a strict quarantine of 12 days. There was a death-like silence on the ship till the captain cried, up the jib, and we left. But, but this entire book, it was book, where, you're going, saying, where you're going, where you're going, that um, he, Humboldt, got the idea which was his major contribution, one of them. One was ecology. He's the father of ecology, um, 
and right through the zones that you'll be you'd be going. Yep. There we Though go. It well, is, that's all people should gold. be warned. It's quite difficult to read Humboldt yes, on this mountain clearly. because he will spend 15 pages on obsidian Bye. and um, <laughs> porphyry. And, we'll wish you and make coming. sure you come back alive. Yeah, yeah, we will, and with your book. Humboldt's rich description of the volcanic landscape gave Darwin a new insight into the possible history of the Earth. He would have done anything to study the geology of the mountain. Armed with Humboldt's book and a volcanologist called Ramon Casillas, his great-great-granddaughter begins the climb. Well, I have to say, I'm becoming a bit of a Humboldt fan. He wouldn't have had this path to walk along so nicely. I mean, even we're having our own trouble. He would have been walking across rocks like this, which are just so incredibly unstable. You can just push them over with your hands. And there was, I mean, OK, he initially came up by donkey, but there's no way he could have brought a donkey up this. It would have been incredibly treacherous. It's really quite a sight at this height of 11,500 feet. The dark blue vault of sky overhead, old streams of lava at our feet. On the other side, this scene of devastation. The crater we climb down into emits only sulfurous vapor. The lava stream breaks out at the sides of the mountain. Fire and water rage below the surface. I notice steam escaping all over the place. So we've got the crater. Okay, this is here. a crater, yes. You can yeah. taste, you can smell I know. the sulfur. Testament the sulfur. to the fact the that gases. it's yes. a living volcano, mm. not extinct. Yes. Yeah, you can smell the sulfur yeah. uh, gaze and the, it's uh, typical from the top. Yeah. Well, we can continue to go. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. We're nearly there now. Tenerife's volcano Tida is still active. Every hundred years or so, it erupts. The last eruption was in 1909, exactly 100 years ago. I'm so pleased we've done this, not just for ourselves, because this is clearly a, an amazing thing to have done. You know, everybody's up here, everybody's got up at four o'clock in the morning. We're all in freezing cold, wearing our pajamas under our trousers. And, uh, but it's particularly special, I guess, for me, because I'm doing something that Charles Darwin so desperately wanted to do and was unable to. Um, so I feel it's a particularly moving moment. While Sarah on the volcano is philosophizing, I have my own thoughts. The results of Darwin's passion for collecting can barely be squeezed into an average museum. I share a small part of his passion. And for me, the highlight of our time on Tenerife is a visit to the museum. But look, this is wonderfully done. This what is a, the way what a surprise. should be displayed, isn't it? You can really... That's real Darwin. Well, exactly, just like the collections yes, that he made. and going in... Um, for the tiniest, tiniest beetles. Incredible. That's how you know it's the real thing. And these guys Darwin got very interested in later, um, in Descent of Man and Sexual Selection. Somebody here loves their beetles, like God and like Darwin. <laughs> when whole day, you remember when he was asked um, what the natural world told him about God? He just said, well, it shows that God had a inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> he made millions of them. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> and quite humbled by this volcano, really, it becomes uh, very clear how small humans and other animals are and how powerful the forces in nature are. 
relacionado con los volcanes, los volcanes tienen un efecto sobre el clima importante. Pero el efecto más, eh, más importante al que se ha mencionado para relacionarlo con las grandes extinciones es la presencia en las erupciones volcánicas de una gran cantidad de eh, ceniza volcánica y aerosoles que producen en la atmósfera un efecto de, eh, de, de opacidad. Y por un lado lo que hacen es descender la temperatura y sobre todo, y más importante, impiden la función clorofílica, la fotosíntesis de las plantas. En este caso, las extinciones que se están produciendo en los últimos años pues, tienen que ver más con, con los efectos que la, la propia actividad humana provoca. ¿no? El, el propio efecto invernadero, eh, la emisión de anhidro carbónico en la atmósfera por parte del hombre, pues está produciendo unos cambios drásticos en la temperatura del planeta y seguramente está produciendo la extinción en determinados lugares de determinadas especies que están adaptadas a un determinado clima. ¿no? The fact that Darwin himself could not land on Tenerife turned volcanic areas into objects of powerful longing for him, which was a great advantage because much more interesting volcanic rocks were waiting for him in South America. We sail from Tenerife to the Cape Verde Islands, and I feel that we've left Europe behind and arrived in Africa. The Congo rainforest, which I know well, lies off to port. While I was there, I often wondered if Darwin had only traveled in the wilds of Africa, would he still have come up with his theory of evolution? The neighborhood of Porto Praia, viewed from the sea, wears a desolate aspect. The island would generally be considered as very uninteresting, but to anyone accustomed only to an English landscape, the novel aspect of an utterly sterile land possesses a grandeur which more vegetation might spoil. A single green leaf can scarcely be discovered over wide tracts of the lava plains, yet flocks of goats together with a few cows, contrive to exist. It rains very seldom, but during a short portion of the year, heavy torrents fall. And immediately afterwards, a light vegetation springs out of every crevice. Well, we've just had a torrent. We've just had a torrent. So that's why it looks so beautifully green. Charles Darwin's view of the world up to this point was so limited that I can barely imagine the excitement he must have felt when discovering these faraway places. Now Sarah and her children are following his trail. Just keep your eyes open. Really, really look. With the same so, amazement as their great, great, great grandfather. There's a big one, isn't it? Now this is his head, very gently, and his two eyes. And these are his gills, where he breathes through. You just see something. Whoa! He's well and truly stuck. Whoa, it's a funny feeling having these suckers clinging on to me. Whoa. There he is. Okay, boys. Should we see if he changes colour? Look how he looks like the colour of the rock now, with all the seaweed growing on it. And what will happen if I put him onto my white trousers? Do you see how he's going white now? Do you see? I can't see any. What about a purple shirt? Purple shirt. Should we see if he can go purple? Well, should we put him back on the rock again? I might pop him back in the water, actually. There he is. See, he's swimming again now. Why is it home? Should be eight, yes.
Rock pools are great places to bring children. There's always so much to look at. And in fact, I think a lot of biologists I know say that their interest in science stemmed from their time as a child looking at rock pools. It really taught them how to observe nature. And observation, of course, is one of the things that Charles Darwin was so unbelievably good at. And as a scientist, this is something that I hope to try and emulate, his powers of observation. In the meantime, on a neighboring island, Sarah is deeply impressed by an extraordinary revelation. Not everyone is happy about it. That's all I'm saying. But you gotta teach the people about Charles Darwin. Teach the people about the man first, you know? But Charles Darwin really didn't do nothing for Africa. Europeans use his concept to really further the concept of exploitation of a superior race over inferior race. Europeans basically started using his teaching to prove that they are superior than Africans because survival of the fittest. So to come to Africa and really name a street after Charles Darwin is an insult to Africans. That's basically what it is. In the evening, back on board, we are treated to our ship's artist Anthony's slideshow about dust. Interesting how it goes so thin at the end. It's quite wide here. Yeah. So you think you'd have to be a, a geologist in the making, or fascinated by geology, in order to spot that at all? Or an artist. What? <laughs> or an artist. An artist. <laughs> yeah, well, why not? Really wow. see this volcanic rock on top. That's really dramatic. Yeah, isn't it? God, look how clean the line is. Yeah. The break between them. Now we're starting to observe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're really looking. We're That's what it's... looking. Next day, it's finally my turn to follow in Darwin's footsteps. My question is, why was this stop such a revelation for Darwin? It is where he learned to look at the world, not just as a biologist, but, thanks to Lyle, as a geologist too. Wow. He's right, they really are embedded. Yeah. Anyway, of shells. When you really start dramatic. looking, you just see shells everywhere, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well done. So how old do you think Hugh Miller or Playfair or the very early geologists would have thought that shell is? Or Lyle? What, would he have put a date on that? Well, what do you think? Well, they'd be very uneasy, because everybody had the magic date of 4004 BC, um, creation of the world. Yeah. Uh, Lyle thought about 400,000 years. Lyle described the Earth's crust as slowly but continuously evolving. He believed that parts of the Earth's surface were pushed upwards by forceful movement from within, which in turn made other parts collapse. To have conceived of this principle was practically heresy at the time Darwin set foot on this land, as it was widely believed, and could be read in the Bible, that the Earth's crust owed its shape to the flood. What do you think if uh, Lyle had published his principles ten years later and Darwin hadn't have had it on the voyage? Couldn't have worked out his theory without giving himself and believing it to be true that the Earth was immensely, immensely old. And he got that from Humboldt and Lyle. You need intellectual ancestors. Intellectual ancestors. As it were, like Lyle and even yeah. Miller and Playfair yeah. and uniformitarianism, and also you need to be part of the British Empire, you need to have canals dug, yeah. and Smith looking at the strata, yeah. and then realizing that all over the country, you can date these strata by the funny little animals in them. Yeah. All that, imagine how exciting it must have been. He was lucky the empire was happening all around him, and the beagle was here.
the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean to Brazil amounts to some 2,000 nautical miles and will take the ship 15 days. The miles glide past in a slow cadenza. I asked myself what part the Beagle's captain, Robert Fitzroy, played in the creation of Darwin's ideas. He had asked Darwin to accompany him because they were both in their 20s and because Darwin was a gentleman, someone he would be happy to dine with every evening. Mike Fitzroy is a descendant of the Beagle's original captain. He considers his great-great-grandfather to be a personal hero, which indeed he may well be, if only because he was the founder of the weather forecast. Our captain, Richard, is as much of a hero. In order to experience how difficult navigation must have been in the 19th century, he has covered up his electronic equipment while crossing the Atlantic Ocean and is now relying, just as Fitzroy did, on the sextant and dead reckoning. During an ocean crossing, we often do that. We, we cover them and then grab the sextant again and do a navigation more or less like your grand grandfather yes. did. Yes. Yeah. Captain Fitzroy was the most important person in the voyage of the Beagle. He decided everything about it, and that's why I think it's very important for me to try and sculpt this bust of him here on our resailing of the voyage and to show to people just how important I personally find Captain Fitzroy. And hopefully this will go some way to redressing the balance of people's view of the voyage, the Beagle, and make people realize just how important a figure Captain Fitzroy really was. During the crossing, the research that has been initiated on board continues to be carried out, even though the researchers have left the ship. It's fascinating to see how each crew member is making a concerted effort to contribute. For example, we are collecting plankton three times a day, which enables us to monitor the health of the oceans. Kijk, hier begin je, hier kan je het zien. Dus dit is zeg maar de laatste, we hebben de 420 mijl mee gevaren. En hij gaat op 500 mijl, dus dit is niet gebruikt. En hier zie je de eerste catch. Plankton collected in a filter seem unremarkable to the naked eye, but under a microscope, these microorganisms become the most beautiful shapes from another world. Tired, having worked all day at the produce of my net, the number of animals that the net collects is very great and fully explains the manner so many animals of a large size live so far from land. Many of these creatures, so low in the scale of nature, are most exquisite in their forms and rich colors. It creates a feeling of wonder that so much beauty should be apparently created for such little purpose. Mm. 
New measuring equipment is being put to work, like the yellow torpedo, the Argo float, an exceptionally clever device that measures two crucial aspects of oceanic data, salt levels and temperature. The data will be collected and transmitted via satellite in order to gauge whether the hot water currents are still moving in the right direction. A change of the currents would result in climate change, the impact of which would be huge. First Officer Arthur is renewing the filters of the dust collector daily in order to collect whatever is floating in the ocean air. The filters are shipped off to Europe for further research, just as Darwin sent off his findings by the mail packet, the postal boat, to England. He is a very extraordinary person. I never before came across a man who I could fancy being a Napoleon or a Nelson. I feel convinced that nothing is too great or too high for him. When young Darwin embarked on his voyage, Fitzroy was his companion. Both men were ambitious. Fitzroy as a naval officer, Darwin to take his place among the men of science. But their perspectives differ on some important points. According to Fitzroy, only the white man is created in God's image, and Darwin disagrees. Have you read Lyle? I don't think so, says Darwin. Peter Nichols views the clash between the two driven young men as the perfect Hollywood scenario. So this is a lovely copy. This is Redmond O'Hanlon's copy of Lyle's Principles of Geology. Fitzroy gave this to Darwin as a scientist. This was making big waves at the time. The uh, principles of geology were suggesting that the Earth had this tremendous age. It was, in fact, millions of years old. It had a tremendous effect on Darwin. Darwin bought it. I mean, I imagine Fitzroy would be saying, Earth without man for a million years after creation, what would be the point? All that beauty and no one to see it. Because Fitzroy could not wrap his mind around the idea that the Earth wasn't created for man, wasn't made to be his domain. Therefore, why would the Earth exist for a million years with, with no man on it? And um, that was where they disagreed. Fitzroy's character was a singular one, with very many noble features. He was devoted to his duty, generous to a fault, bold, determined, and indomitably energetic, and an ardent friend to all under his sway. Fitzroy's temper was a most unfortunate one, and was shown not only by passion, but by fits of long-continued moroseness against those who had offended him. His temper was usually worst in the early morning, and with his eagle eye, he could generally detect something amiss about the ship and was then unsparing in his blame. Robert Fitzroy's statue is completed after eight days. The unveiling of it is marked by an official ceremony. It's a great honour for me to unveil this bust of Robert Fitzroy today on the very path he took to South America over 200 years ago. He was always, and always will be, a true hero to me. I'd like to unveil here. the statue. Here, here, yes. We could raise, yeah. raise our glasses to Admiral Fitzroy. He's at war with himself. So it's a war movie inside a, inside a person. I mean, that's, that's about as reduced as I could get as a pitch, and I think it's a good one. He's a, he, and he's, he's, at, he's at war with himself, but he's also in this sort of the inside of a hurricane of history. 
that's going on at the time where between Darwin and God, if you like, or you know, those, the thinking, the scientific thinking and, and religion. And Fitzroy uh, embodies all of that in, in one person. So the whole of this sort of hurricane of science and religion that's going on in the early 19th century is actually taking place inside one man, and he's on the Beagle steering Charles Darwin around the world. On day 10 of the crossing, the captain believes the equator has been reached. It's how we're going to be able to say, now 24 hours later, and now we're going to be two miles next. Just past the equator. The interesting thing about Fitzroy's story is that he could never have been a Darwin. By feeding the young Darwin information from books and by taking him on this voyage, he pointed Darwin in the direction of his theory. But to his death, Fitzroy would reject the idea of evolution. After two weeks of nothing but water, land appears on the horizon. We are approaching the harbor town of Salvador de Bahia. Delight is a weak term to express the feelings of a naturalist who, for the first time, has wandered by himself in a Brazilian forest. The elegance of the grasses, the novelty of the parasitical plants, the beauty of the flowers, the glossy green of the foliage. But above all, the general luxuriance of the vegetation filled me with admiration. A most paradoxical mixture of sound and silence pervades the shady parts of the wood. The noise from the insects is so loud that it may be heard even in a vessel anchored several hundred yards from the shore. Yet within the recesses of the forest, a universal silence appears to reign. To a person fond of natural history, such a day as this brings with it a deeper pleasure than he can ever hope to experience again. Sarah is anxious to see what has happened to the flora that so deeply impressed her great-great-grandfather. It seems that none of the original vegetation has survived. This is the Bay of All Saints that the Beagle would have moored, and Darwin probably would have walked down this track to the old city where we are now, and the city was then surrounded by tropical forest, Atlantic forest. They could hear the rainforest from the noise of the forest from the Beagle as it was moored, so that just shows how close it was. And today, there's absolutely none to be seen at all. We've got to drive a long way to find the Atlantic Forest now. Sarah sets off in search of the rainforest. While Sarah is on her way to the place that made such a lasting impression on her great-great-grandfather, I am joined by Antony in search of the downside of these magical rainforests. Here, in a British cemetery, it is believed three of the Beagle's crew members lie buried. They died shortly after their visit to the jungle as a result of malaria, bad air, malaria. But you see, Darwin wondering about why it is that Humboldt and Bonplan can spend almost forever um, in a rainforest and, and be all right. But when they come out to a little settlement of town, they get ill. Well, he didn't know, uh, but it's obvious that's where the pools of infection are. It's not in, actually out in the rainforest. The most dangerous place is uh, in the 
towns on the Is that equator. Where you caught yes, it was yeah, it's really brought home to me. I'd only um, been in Brazzaville for ten days, and I'd been counting the number of mosquito bites. You know, an old pro, and I'd only had five bites. So I thought, well, this is all a myth. But of course, infection rates very bite. different. Yeah, probably 100% infected. And uh, actually, so much is going on, and you're passing into delirium that you never have a, a, a calm moment when you think, I'm dying. Uh, it's just too violent an experience. And um, I kept asking, apparently, for more clothes to be put on top of the, the bed because I was so intensely cold, dreaming I was naked in the really? snow and ice. Cold. But actually, the sweat pouring off, and I lost two and a half stone. And thank God for modern science. We failed to find the graves. The men were only sailors, which must have meant their grave merited a mere wooden cross, and that would have entirely disintegrated by now. Sarah is still looking for the rainforest, but only finds sugarcane and tobacco plantations. On one of them, she spoke to the owner about the loss of tropical forests. What was the job that you were employed to do? The job was uh, to run a farm, but there was no farm. There was a pure uh, jungle. So you got to Brazil and found? Found jungle. You, you call in people, and they started to cut the trees. And then they... What, with chainsaws? No, with uh, the saw, yeah, and dropped, and then they clean it all, and they cut it exactly in the size that the people wanted. And then they sold. Yes, okay, and then uh, it goes to another place and to, uh, to all these places. So uh, it was very normal to do it. Yeah. Everybody did it. And then once a year, when it is a dry peer, you put fire in it, and it burns all down, and then you can plant grass. Right. Yes? So then so you th at that time, that time when it was living there, uh, you saw only uh, uh, yeah. clouds of fire and clouds of uh, smoke. Everybody was doing it. And how many, hectares? Thing, yeah? how many hectares altogether? 500 hectares. 500 right hectares. Yes. And how do you go about cutting down a rainforest? I didn't feel so bad, but I think it was a wonderful thing to do it because everybody was doing it. I was a part of, uh, of, of everybody. Don't forget one thing, at that time Brazil wanted to open the country. And how you open the country? To, to cut it. Mm -hmm. And there was no pressure from outside the uh, world, from the outside to say, you can't do that. Further inland, a family member of Sarah's, the ecologist Josh Barlow, treks through the real rainforest. He too can call Darwin his great-great-grandfather. It's never been a big issue for me. On average, I'll probably have 3% of his genome. That's not a great deal. What I really respect about the man are his ideas and not uh, some potential link in the family. This picture here demonstrates what an understory fire looks like in the Amazon. Um, you can see here that the flame heights are actually very low, probably not more than 30 centimetres. Um, this is mainly due to the fact that the canopy is very closed above and keeps the moisture within the forest. So the forests don't normally burn. This is only under extreme drought conditions, such as we had in the 1998 El Nino event or the 2005 drought in the Western Amazon. On the tobacco plantation, Sarah is happy to discover that the planters are not simply felling trees. Now they are planting new ones. Here we started several years ago, and you can already see that all the trees are growing up. And that is what we say that is uh, the Mata Landica, which will be the Mata Landica, let's say, in, in 50 or 100 years of time, yes? Because the strong ones will stay, the weaker ones will disappear. This is what we call the second growth, huh? Eh? 
Six years huh? after this was grassland, you really begin to get the feeling of rainforest. Yes. Now, and if you come here in the morning at six o'clock with all these birds and singing, this is wonderful. Yes. And now, if you go back six years, it was uh, cows running yeah. around here. Yeah. So I, I think you can do something yeah. if you want. Yeah. And here you see we don't protect it anymore. Finish. So now the seeds of the trees drops, and then you get growth of smaller trees. Uh, second, uh, animals bring seed in it. So now in the coming years, it is growing for itself. But so still, you, still you have grass, yes, but it will disappear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Josh and a group of Brazilian biologists research the effects of increasingly common forest fires. That's what we're looking at now. We're interested in how the forest is recovering 11 years after the fires. And uh, well, in some cases, it seems to be recovering quite well. We don't see so many of the large trees that have died. They've fallen over and they're starting to decompose. Um, and there's a lot of regeneration as well in the understory. But what we're interested in is the actual the nature of that regeneration, whether the species composition is very different or not. Our hypothesis is that birds in burned place and disturbed place are more asymmetric than in an unburned place. It's a measurement of stress. The disturbance are influenced in the size of the bird. Uh. Maybe it's altering something in the genotype. Well, some of the predictions show the Amazon in a hundred years' time, for example, being more like a savanna than a forest, and that's a very alarming prediction. So it would essentially be a, yeah, a, a scrubby system dominated by a few pioneer species instead of this wonderful dark green forest full of uh, amazing species that it, we have now. I think it's really important to do this kind of research so we can actually see the effects and you can show those effects to the politicians and people so they can make informed choices about what's actually going on. It's very difficult for them to understand the consequences of this kind of, uh, these kinds of fires, for example, if no one goes into the forest and actually shows them how bad it can be for wildlife and for the tree mortality. Sarah finally finds the rainforest, many miles away from the coast. Her enchantment is as great as Darwin's. A most paradoxical mixture of sound and silence pervades the shady parts of the wood. The noise from the insects is so loud that in the evening it can be heard even in a vessel anchored several hundred yards from the shore. Yet, within the recesses of the forest, when in the midst of it, a universal stillness appears to reign. Darwin is now well on the way to taking his one small step for a man, his theory of evolution by natural selection, which became one giant leap for mankind. It took us from the Middle Ages to the modern world. Edmund, I've wanted to visit the Amazon for years, but reading a book, I'm not entirely sure I want to anymore. It seems a little bit dangerous. Is it really as bad as it appears? Uh, you'd be fine, but I underplayed it a bit, I think. Yeah, it is bad. I think the point is that 
we must all love the rainforest, but we can't expect the rainforest to love us back. I mean, imagine you're cutting your way through to this mountain, the Blina, and little tiny streams that are 40 feet deep, and every time you jostle a, a, a leaf with a hornet's nest behind it, and they're everywhere, 40 hornets come at you all at once. So someone screams a vespa. You dive into the river and you put your hat over your head, stop them stinging you on the back of the neck. And then I always thought, I just hope there is no anaconda right here. But that's the animal that every, everybody is afraid of. So everything's trying to kill you, basically? Yeah, basically, everybody in the jungle is just so pleased to see you because they're hungry. But yeah, it's a beautiful place.